There's a question I've been asking myself recently that I want to put before you today. How seriously do I take the cause of Jesus in the world? This is a relevant question all the time, but maybe it's especially relevant today as we gather together to talk about what's called the mission of God on Missions Sunday, a service set aside for the mission of God in the world. And so this question is something that we're going to be reflecting on in our time together. And I recognize that as I ask that question, there's going to be different responses for different people. For some of us, we take the cause of Jesus seriously, so seriously that we've actually given our entire life to it. We've heard the voice of God, we've answered his call, and we've gone out into the world to play our part to see his kingdom come on earth as is in heaven. For some of us, right here and right now, we're all in, we're living on mission. But for other, others of us, we might have a different response, either because there's a lack of awareness or clarity or urgency in our lives. So maybe today for you, it's a lack of awareness. Like you don't know what the cause of Jesus is. And so when we ask that question, you don't have any basis for answering it or even understanding what the mission of God is in the world. That might be your posture as you come into our time together today. But maybe it's not a lack of uh, awareness. Maybe it's a lack of, of clarity. Maybe you know what the cause of Jesus is, but you don't know what your part to play in it is. You're still waiting to, to have your place and your purpose in God's kingdom unveiled and revealed to you. And so you're waiting to find out what that is. And so what you need is, is clarity. But maybe it's not lack of awareness or lack of clarity. Maybe for you, it's this lack of urgency. You're neither hot nor cold towards the cause of Jesus. You're just lukewarm. And that might be for many different reasons. It might be because you have lots on your plate right now. It might be because you have other things that are really important and need your attention right now. It might be that your spiritual condition is lukewarm, that you're not on fire for Jesus. You're not uh, stoked up about joining him and what he wants to do in the world. And so the mission and the cause of Jesus is not something that you're thinking about or is high on your priority list right now. See, we all come into today from different places and whatever that is for you and however you come into this place, here's my hope for today is that God would amplify our collective hunger for his son Jesus and his cause in the world and that together we'd seek the flourishing of our city with greater urgency coming out of today. And so in this short time together that we have, let's open up the Bible and let's turn to a book of the Bible called Acts. You can find it in the New Testament. We're going to start in the very first verse of the first chapter of Acts with these words. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so the story of Acts begins in the 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his return to be with God. Jesus has died. He has come back to life. He has defeated sin and Satan and death. And now he's with his followers as the resurrected King and Lord of the entire universe. And he's preparing them to continue what he has started in his life, death, and resurrection. So Acts 1 is a, is a time of preparation He's getting his followers ready to carry out his cause in the world. And the way that Jesus does that is by giving his followers, his church, a mission and a message. In Acts verse 8 of chapter 1, Jesus reveals the mission that he's sending his followers on. And that mission is this, is that the church is to go out into the world and bear witness to Jesus. Our mission as the church is to tell the world about what we've seen and what we've heard and what we've experienced in Jesus. And Jesus says it's going to start with this small group of followers in the city of Jerusalem. And then it's 
going to move out from there like a tidal wave to new people and to new regions until it reaches the ends of the earth. It's that this mission to tell the world about Jesus is going to start small, but it's just going to rapidly advance and continue it to advance until it reaches to the ends of the earth. This is the cause of Jesus in the world. It's both local and it's global. It's for all people. It's for every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. No one is exempt. God has his vision to reach the whole world with the name of Jesus. This is the mission that the church and God's people have been given. And Jesus tells us that we aren't just to go and do this, that we are to go with a message. And that message is simple, that Jesus is alive and he is king. And this message, if you're unaware, has its roots in the ancient story of God's people, Israel. You can find God speaking about it to his people in places like Isaiah 9, chapter 11 and 42 in Isaiah, as well as in Psalm 2 and 72. And in all those places, God is making these promises. He's talking about a day where he would send a Messiah, a king, to rescue his people and set up a never-ending kingdom right here on earth. And this kingdom God's talking about, it's not a militaristic or a nationalistic kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom that will invade every life and every corner of planet Earth through the presence and the activity of this promised king. And so God makes all these promises and the people waited. And they waited. And they waited. Until one day when Jesus shows up and he says this, the time has come. He, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is an announcement that what God has promised is finally happening in Jesus. The king is here and he's launching the rule and reign of God on earth and everyone is invited in. All you have to do is turn to Jesus and believe in him. That's all you have to do to get involved in this new heavenly kingdom invading earth. And so what we see is that through the presence and the teaching and ultimately the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that the kingdom has started to come and is coming on earth as it is in heaven in greater and greater ways. Jesus launched it and it continues to arrive and be experienced on earth through his followers. And Acts brings us into this moment between the arrival of the kingdom and the fulfillment of the kingdom, and it says that here and now, what Jesus has started is going to continue with us. Is that Jesus began it, and now he's sending us to continue what he began. We see it here in Acts 1 and in other places, like the Gospel of John, one of the stories about Jesus' life, where Jesus says this to his followers. He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. In other words, Mission begins with Jesus, but it continues with us. We have been sent by Jesus to go out into the world in the power of the Spirit to let it know through what we say and what we do that Jesus is alive and he is king and the kingdom is here and everyone is invited in to experience this. This is the cause of Jesus in the world. That's what he sent us to go and do. And if you notice that the way it's gonna happen is through ordinary people like me and like you who are filled with the extraordinary presence and power of God, who will give us what we need to go out into the city and out into the world to seek its flourishing. This is what Jesus envisioned the church doing, his people doing. He sent us to the ends of the earth. He sent us to our workplaces, to our families, to our schools, to our sports teams, and to the nations to continue his work to see the kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's the cause of Jesus. That's what we've been sent to do. Not just some of us, but all of us. Together, playing our part. And what we need to see is that the church, God's people, is central to Jesus' plan. The church is not just a part of the plan or included in one stage of the plan. It is God's central plan, his primary plan to reach the world. And so as the message of Jesus goes out beyond Jerusalem, out into Judea and Samaria, and it continues to move further out into the world, we see that God uses churches to advance his cause in the world. Like the church we see in Acts chapter 13, which is where I want to take us to kind of show us a picture of a church that's on fire for the mission of God in the world. 
It's a church in a city called Antioch, and Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3 tells us about that church. Listen to this. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This is a church that takes the cause of Jesus seriously. They're not messing around or, or taking what God wants to do in the world lightly. They are all in and open and available to what God wants to do to see his cause advance in the world. And if you notice, this church is marked by three things that position them to play their part in God's mission. The first of which is the most important. They have a hunger for God. This is a church with an urgent desire to encounter God and hear his voice. Acts 13 shows us that they are gathered together, they are worshiping, they are fasting, they are praying, they are positioning themselves to seek God and ask him for fresh direction and guidance. The atmosphere of this church is one of urgent desire for God, a hunger for him that cannot be contained. And it reminds me of our boys before dinner time. See, our boys, no matter how many snacks we give them before dinner, they always want more. It's never enough. They're always coming to us asking for more. And we often find them in the, in the pantry or in the fridge with arms full of chips or squeezy packs and fruit and treats that my wife has made, all kinds of stuff. They have this insatiable appetite around dinner time. They just can't get enough. And we're actually scared about how much they're gonna eat when they're teenagers. Like that's how scary their appetite already is. They already eat so much um, that we're actually scared how they're gonna eat when they're, when they're teenagers, so pray for us. But when I think of my kids, I also think of this church in Antioch. That the church in Antioch had this insatiable hunger for God. They want him and they want him to come near. They position themselves for that to happen as they pray and worship and fast. There's this hunger for God in this church. And there's also this openness to the Holy Spirit. See, they're not closed off to the Spirit. They want him to speak. They're waiting on him. They have this expectancy that the Holy Spirit's going to show up and that he will speak. And when you put a group of people in a room with this kind of hunger, and this kind of openness to the wildness of the Holy Spirit, that's when God's stuff happens. That's when God shows up. I love what A.W. Tozer, pastor and author, writes about this. He says, God comes where he is wanted. See, God wants to be wanted, and he shows up where people are open to him and are hungry for him. In this church, they want God, don't they? They're fasting, they're praying, they're ready for him to show up, and when he does, they're ready to respond. Because look at what happens as they're doing this, as they're worshiping and praying. God the Holy Spirit shows up and says, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. See, the Spirit of God comes and the Spirit of God says, Give me your two best leaders to go play their part that I have for them in the cause of Jesus in the world. Set them apart for me and for this mission to go take the message of Jesus to the non-Jewish world. Your two best leaders, give them to me and send them. And you know what this church does? They do. They respond by praying and fasting and worshiping some more, and they lay their hands on Barnabas and Saul, and they send them to fulfill the part that they have to play in what God wants to do in the world. And this shows us the third thing that marks a church on fire for the mission of God, is that they are willing to send, even if it's costly. Because after hearing from God, this church sends Barnabas and Saul. They're not hoarding their resources. They're not trying to hold on to, the, to their best people. They're not living in a, in a scarcity mindset. They're living in a sending mindset. And this is a challenge to us. It's a challenge to me. Because as we see this church release its best people and bless them as they go with joy, it challenges our perception that we need to hoard our resources, that we can't afford it, that we can't lose our best people. What if, we, what if that happens? It challenges that mindset that we have in the Western church. But this church, what they understood is that Jesus' vision for the church doesn't involve people sitting in seats. It involves sending people to go into the world to seek its flourishing. And Barnabas and Saul, 
they were willing to go. So this wasn't just a partnership where a church was willing to send. It had people that were willing to go. It wasn't about their comfort. It was about the cause. And when you put a church that is willing to send together with people that are willing to go, you have something that God can use to impact the world. This is the kind of people and the kind of church that Jesus envisions. A people who are hungry for God. A people who are open to the wildness and the power of the Holy Spirit. And a people who are willing to send even if it is costly. And for many years, Central Heights has been that kind of church. We've sent people all over the world. We've sent people to our cities and to the nations over and over and over again. And we've had people who have been willing to go. We have been that kind of church and that's something to celebrate. But let's not settle. Let's not rest on what we've done in the past, but let's go for more together. Because we have a great God and a great cause. There is no one like Jesus. He has surpassing worth and beauty. He's the answer to all our longings and questions and hopes and people need to encounter him for themselves and people need a people who are willing to go and to tell them about it, to show them who Jesus is like by how they live and the way they love. And we've been sent by Jesus to have a part in doing that. What a privilege. We have a great God and he has given us a great cause and today we have the opportunity to join God in his work in the world, either by sending, by giving, or by going. So as we close, let me ask you and invite you to ask God, how do you want me to join you in what you want to do in the world? Open yourself up to him, let him speak to you and let's respond together for the flourishing of our city and the world. Just like the people in these stories that, that we're going to share with you in a moment responded to the God who called them. We are Christian Julian Yuganitz with Mission Aviation Fellowship in Papua, Indonesia. Half a world away is where we live, work, and serve. It's where we've been sent and where we choose to be. Where we spend our lives. But for what? Why there? Papua Indonesia with its people and beauty, with its struggles and pain. It's a place of need. A place where an airplane can make all the difference. The distances from one place to another may not necessarily be all that far. But consider this, there are no roads. There are people living throughout the mountains in villages that only have two modes of transportation. An airplane or bare feet. That's it. Hauling over one ton of passengers and cargo at a time, we're making a lasting impact on those who live with these challenges. Flights lasting minutes rather than hikes that take weeks bring food, supplies, building materials, animals, teachers, medical help, and hope. Last semester I started instructing English at Papua Hope Language Institute, which we call FLY for short, P-H-L-I, and it is an institute that prepares high school graduates to attend American universities. I absolutely love teaching these students. They are young adults and they are a part of a culture that I've lived in for a while and I get to teach them my mother tongue. Good morning. But And you're saying this is my greatest achievement but it is God who has provided this for me, right? And that's that's the thing that we need to balance out as we as God blesses us that we that we walk in confidence but humility too right not but in confidence but not
pride, right? So that's something that God needs to help us with all the time. At times, we have been able to travel to interior villages where Chris flies, experiencing life among Papuan tribes. Our most recent trip was to Korupun, a village south of us, where Chris flies to about once a month. Taya was with us during this summer of 2021 trip. We stayed in the former home of a Christian martyr, a missionary who was killed by bows and arrows in 1968. It is so good to get a feel for village life, connecting with villagers, learning how the people live and spend their time. We chatted, listened, walked, and attended church. Walking through life with our brothers and sisters in God's kingdom here in Indonesia is full of challenges that brings learning, growth, and character development. Sometimes it's tough, but it certainly doesn't lack his peace, protection, provision, and ever-present help. By his strength, we continue searching, supporting, strengthening, serving, and stewarding. Our desire is for the impact we make in what we do to reflect the love and grace shown to us in Christ. Our Father, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we've seen some of the whys, and your prayer and support of our work here is part of the how, so thank you. Let us all continue to reach out as the Lord Jesus does to us, so that others may come to know him and walk with him. My name is uh, Andrei Zolotaryov, and uh, I am here together with my wife Lyudmila and with my daughter Zlata. And Zlata is part of Central High Church, and that's actually how we get to know uh, Central High Church. And also we have our son Mark, who is at Trinity now. Unfortunately, this time we arrived not just to visit, but as people who uh, leave the country because of the, the war, because, because of the violence. And this was a time when, as a family, we think about being together, supporting each other, because it's very challenging and very difficult time for many Ukrainians, for many families who are divided, who are stressed, who are traumatized. Uh, we live in the community of 20 families, and thanks uh, our daughter Zlata, Mark, <coughs> their work with Multinational Missionary Foundation and also with members of Central High Church, Blaine and Carol and their team, uh, they helped to settled and find a place for quite a big group of Ukrainians. We had uh, connection and talked to you know, pastors here from Central High Church, to Rod and to Tim, and we talked about Ukrainian group, and they were very, very open to think, to help uh, us to have a place. And now we can meet at the uh, Nichols Halls, and for many people who came through different stress, traumas, living sometimes in very difficult situation, running away from the uh, war. Now we have this comfortable place when we can come together, we can pray together, we can glorify God, and we can also listen to His words. Now regularly about 50, 60 people come together to meet, to pray. And as a group of Ukrainians, we connected to some other people who are not believers. Uh, and sometimes it's happened in the hospital when we were with our children. Some of them we met uh, in the shop and we said to them, hey, how we can help you. We provide them some our possible support, translation. And we invite, of course, for our Bible study, for our meeting at the church. And time to time they are coming to visit the church, they are coming on our Wednesday Bible studies that we still do in our community. And uh, this is a great time when we can serve those people as well. We were able to organize day camp for children, but also we connected to many other Ukrainians who live here, even who live here for five, six, seven, seven ten years. So they bring their children and it was a good time for us to unite, to show that church is a 
safety place. As a team of uh, ministers, as a church, we try to be open and see how we can serve the first Ukrainians who are here. We have a big group of Ukrainians who arrived. There is no Slavic or Ukrainian on Russian-speaking church, and there are quite many believers and especially unbelievers. So we want to reach them. We want to help them. We want to encourage them, to help them to go through the challenges that they have. But also we want to focus, we want to focus them on the Christ, on the relationship with God. And Ukrainian church can be the first place where they can find, because I would say many of them don't speak uh, English and it's difficult for them. But we also try to encourage our young people and people who uh, speak English to be part of a uh, good Canadian church, part of relationship to visit uh, any meetings or events that they have. And so we hope to be, uh, to serve Ukrainian group, Ukrainian community, but also be open for the society, for other people who are around us, so that through our life, through our work, through our ministry, the name of God would be glorified. A few uh, verses that uh, usually help me. We can read, uh, when Jesus was going on the heaven, he said to disciples, I will be with you. I will be with you in time of happiness. I will be with you in time of difficulties. So when we go through, when we cry, we believe that Jesus is with us. And also we, when we are happy, he also with us. And it's uh, help us to go through the challenges. And of course, we know that we have the great future uh, with him. So uh, it's a time to enjoy here, but also with hope on future that we will have him in heaven. We are so thankful what God provides us through uh, your church, through people, through Christians. And we also ask God what he's, he wants us to do. My name's Fred. I'm the owner of Sutherland Landscaping. Um, we've been uh, existent since 2014, but uh, full, full time since 2020. And we are a legitimate landscape company trying to provide professional services for the community. And I think that in itself glorifies God. Um, doing work with integrity on a daily basis. We're doing it with a missional vision. So redemptive entrepreneurship is a term that I hold dear to my heart. We're trying to run a company that is a legitimate company, but also has the mission of Jesus as its center point. And so we're trying to integrate uh, personal development, character formation into a landscaping environment so that we can have an impact for the glory of God in our, in our community. I didn't grow up in the church, so I met Christ at, at the age of 16. So ever since I was became a Christian, I've always been passionate about people meeting Jesus like I had the opportunity to. But really a calling to mission came on a beach in Thailand when I was about 18. I was uh, hanging out with Ricky and Karen Sanchez, which our church supports. And they just, um, they asked us on a beach, like, would you consider giving your life to the mission of Jesus? And it was in that moment that I was like, yes, this is what I wanna do. Um, so I've been living on mission ever since then. I feel called to people building. I feel like I'm a coach. And so in my mind, what I'm, what I'm trying to target is I'm trying to help people grow while they work for us. And so right now, I, I consider myself building an airplane while I'm flying it. <laughs> There's some of the formal processes that I hope will come in the future are not there, but a lot of that um, currently is just meeting with the guys, talking about how they're doing, helping them discover their gifts, um, introducing content into, into their lives that maybe they haven't thought about, um, things around discipline, things about calling, um, and just helping them find their direction uh, and also grow in their personal character. In the future, I hope to uh, formalize some of this uh, so it, it's a little more clean and there's a structure to it. But right now it's it's just flowing out of my heart, if you could say that. When I think about mission, I, I like to think about a, a prophetic picture that was given to me when I was about 18. Um, there was a girl in my high school that one night was praying and she was praying for me and she saw a picture of a broken pot uh, with a bunch of pieces on the ground. And then Jesus came and he put put the pot back together and over, over he filled it with water to the overflow. And to me, um, when that was spoken over my life, it was, was 
profoundly impactful. And it was a true prophetic word because Jesus, when we meet him in our brokenness, he puts us back together. He fills us with his Holy Spirit so that we can actually pour out and love on other people. And so to me, the mission of Jesus is exactly that, meeting him first and out of the work he's doing in us, out of the overflow of that, um, ministering to others. I think something I've been sitting with a lot lately is the power of culture making, um, that we actually have influence uh, wherever we are, whether it's in our workplace or our family or at school, and that when you're living in right relationship with Jesus, you actually have potential to influence the culture that you're living in. What I mean by culture is like the, the ethos in your environment, the, the, the character, the, the feeling that you're, you're experiencing when you're at work or you're at school. And I think we as Christians have power to influence that. And when you're influencing that um, for good, when you're living out of love and kindness and integrity, um, you're gonna impact other people and you can cause them to ask questions that then you can share the answers that you have from your own life. And I think as, um, I think we, we don't see the opportunity that's in front of us. Particularly, I'm passionate about business owners or leaders. And when you have uh, authority to actually shape a culture or shape an organization, and you're doing that intentionally from a kingdom mindset, that's powerful. And so I would say um, to anyone who's watching this, maybe take some time to pray about what that looks like for you in your context, whether it's home, it's school, it's work, how is God calling you to shape culture intentionally? Um, I think I'm pretty confident he's gonna have an assignment for you. And you can actually have a positive impact for the kingdom and for the glory of God when you, when you live out of that.